It's kind of funny how things come together because on the 10th anniversary of this building in uh, 2003, uh, we had a big anniversary of the building service because it was a lot and it was really a good way to uh, move through some of the memories of the fire that had taken the uh, second church, the A-frame. And I remember uh, Jack Carr, Reverend Jack Carr, Reverend Dr. Jack Carr, sorry, Your, your Majesty. Uh, the Reverend Dr. Jack Carr preached uh, the beginning part of the sermon, and then I preached the second part of the sermon, and I preached on uh, no one who puts their hand at the plow but turns back is fit for the kingdom of God. It's, again, one of those great mic drop comments by Jesus, right? No one who puts their hand at the plow and turns back is fit for the kingdom of God. Boom. Just sit with that for a while. This is one of my favorite scripture lessons. Those of you who know me well know that already. Let the dead bury their dead. It's Jesus being really punchy. He's just really very... Um, the Gospel of Thomas, which isn't in our four Gospels, but uh, another well-known Gospel, uh, has Jesus speaking in those kind of pithy statements all the time. Very much like the other teachers of his time. Just straight, clear... Perf um, is perfunctory the right word? I don't know. Straight, kind of uh, pithy statements about uh, almost proverbial... And so this is Jesus in that mood. But it starts with this. They went to a Samaritan village, and the Samaritans didn't welcome Jesus. Why? Because his face was set towards Jerusalem. You know what that means in the gospel. There was a time when Jesus finally decided he better go down to Jerusalem. And the disciples and Jesus knew that most likely he could be killed there. There were people who wanted his life. But he set his face towards Jerusalem. I'm going down. It could be trouble. But he was going anyway. And the Samaritans in this village didn't want any piece of it. They knew Jesus was a rabble rouser. They knew the Romans were unhappy with him. They knew Herod didn't like him. So why would they want a piece of that action? And it says in the scripture from today, they did not welcome him because his face was set towards Jerusalem. So he was a hot politic. He was... Um, uh, a dissident, a rebel, a rouser. He did the spirit. So I, I can't understand that. Well, James and John, the brothers of thunder, they didn't call them that for nothing. They always had a bit of attitude. They're the ones who just recently had asked Jesus which one of them would sit at his right hand. You know, they're vying for power. They didn't seem to get the message Jesus gave them about power the first time. So here they come up and say, Jesus, if you just ask us, we will use our power. And we'll ask God to bring down fire on the Samaritan village. Poor Samaritans. Right? Imagine if the Good Samaritan story ended with, and then the Samaritan, having done all this, went home and found his village burned down because of James and John. Right? So the brothers of thunder are up to no good, and they, they just think, boy, they didn't welcome Jesus. How dare they not know who Jesus is and not care about him and give us... And the hospitality was awful. And, you know, there was that scripture about shaking the dust off their feet, Jesus said. Just shake the, the dust off your feet if a town doesn't... No, they wanted more. They want to bring fire down on these. And Jesus, it just he doesn't explain. It just says he rebukes them. They had a pretty strong response to bad hospitality, if you ask me. It's a little overact, overreactive on uh, James and John's part. But Jesus rebukes them. And I had to look up the word rebuke in Greek... Because I thought, I wonder what it really means. Like, I looked up what rebuke means in the English language. But it's from the word epitomio in Greek. It has been translated to rebuke, but also in the same gospel, it's been used to warn. And he warned them not to speak of this to anybody. Same word, epitomio. And also to charge them. And he charged them, don't say this to anybody, or he charged them, blah, blah, blah. That's epitomeo, same thing. And also rebuke, he rebuked the winds and the storm. Right? Remember? Right? A rebuke is usually, uh, we think, a sharp critique or criticism, a sharp commandment to a person to set them straight. The root of the Greek word, uh, tomeo, is to assign value. I thought that was interesting. So, uh, epi is upon. So, to put upon or to put an assigned value to something. Jesus is saying in the rebuke, there's something of deep value here that I'm going to ask you to assign to it. He rebukes them. He asks them to turn in a different direction. 
And his response basically says, leave the Samaritans alone. They have different views than us. Big deal. Let's move on. And so they do. It caught me this week because the initial lesson, just from that piece, is to keep living into the light, stay focused on what you are for, and leave those who don't want to join you alone. That's what caught me right away. And Jesus rebuked them. No, we're not going to bring fire down on Samaritans. We're just going to leave them alone. And we are very much a people, like President Bush once said, if they're not for us, they're against us. Jesus said, if they're not against us, they're for us. See the difference? Just, just leave them alone. Be what you are for, not what you are against. Stay focused. Live into the light. Then I just read this this morning as I was sitting in my office. Megan Rapino. I hope I've got her last name. Anybody watch soccer? The American soccer? Yeah, is it Rapino? Megan Rapino? Or Rapino? She's uh, the star of the U.S. women's soccer team. She won. Got two goals against France the other day in the quarterfinal. 2-1 game. And they were asking her, as a, as, a, as a lesbian woman, whether it was really important for her to win this. And I, I love this. She says, listen, there's never been a gold medal win without gay people on the team. It's a fact in history. It's science. I like it. She said, that's just science. You can't win without gay people when you're playing women's soccer. But then she says this. I am motivated by people who like me who are fighting for the same things. I'm motivated by people who are like me who are fighting for the same things. I take more energy from that than for trying to prove anyone wrong. The reporter was trying to trap her into saying negative things about people who disagree with her lifestyle. And she says, I'm more motivated by people who, like me, are fighting for the same things. I take more energy from that than trying to prove anyone wrong. It's exactly what I read in Jesus this week. Listen, don't worry about people who are not doing what we're doing. We're set towards Jerusalem. Let's go. And then he follows it up with people coming to him. What can I do? How can I go? What can I, you know, let me follow you. Jesus says, follow me. And everybody's got an excuse. Everybody's got an excuse. He says, follow me. Well, i got to go home and bury my father first. Jesus says, let the dead bury the dead. It's not his most pastoral. It's not his most loving comment. Let the dead bury the dead. But in that, there's this depth. That those who do not want to come towards the light, those who do not understand living truly in Christ, leave them alone. Let them keep doing what they're doing. Let the dead bury their dead. We've got bigger things. We've got to move towards the light, Jesus says. And then that famous comment, no one who puts their hand to the plow. You know, the plow with the oxen on the front. No one who puts their hand to the plow. I think it's called a wedge plow in the soil like this. And you've got the strap for the, the reins and you're pushing and they're pulling. And no one who puts their hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. That's me. I'd always look back. I'm an extrovert. I'm like, I got my hand at the plow. What's going on back at the farmhouse? Did someone just come in the yard? Oh, why? What a beautiful bird that is. And then, you know, your furrows. This is good old logic. Anyone who puts their hand to the plow and looks anywhere else is going to get windy lines. And then your carrots and your beets are going to be all messed up. Or your wheat's going to be like this. And then how do you cut it? But also, those who put their hand to the work of God and turn towards the light and look back to the darkness are not fit for the kingdom of God. Be defined by what you are for, not what you're against. It's a great Christian lesson. Can't be overstated. And that brings me to the pride sign. I didn't get to preach on it a couple weeks ago. But you know we had the Facebook, I put a Facebook post on about the pastor who called me on a Friday pride sign was up, happy pride. It's like our fifth year having a pride sign, sixth year maybe. It was a beautiful one this time, very beautiful. And the pastor called me and told me I was wrong and all that kind of stuff. I'm like, you know, I live in a Christian church. I've heard that I've been wrong before. I also live with teenagers. So it's not that I'm wrong, but just it was, it was just what surprises me is the energy it takes for that person to pick up the phone. They're so determined 
And, and, and I just get, I have two calls, actually, phone calls that week. And, and both times I'm not sure that the people really knew why they were calling. But as some of you know, when I asked the pastor, why did you call? I'm interested in why you called, because obviously we're, we disagree on the Bible. That's pretty obvious. Uh, and they said, well, give your head a shake. So then I realized it was just a rude phone call. Like this person just wanted to tell me I'm wrong and stupid and have not studied the Bible well. They're wasting their time chasing people who don't agree with them instead of just being about what we're about. But that launched into a big Facebook thing and it got shared 400 times on different people's pages. And one of the comments I got from some naysayers on my thread was, why do you have to shame this pastor publicly? Which is interesting because I still don't know that pastor's name. I have no idea who they were. And so I didn't think I was shaming anybody publicly whatsoever. I just was tired. It's all I put on there. I'm just tired of this kind of stuff. I didn't call it stuff, though. I used a bad word, which then I regretted that it went public. Sorry if you've had to apologize to people for your pastor, for your ministry, using a bad word. It was a pretty light word of the bad words, but still, it was a bad word. I just tired of it. And, and I was weary, and I just thought my friends should know, and then all of a sudden the whole world knew, and then David Curtin's interviewing me on the radio, and on we go. But even David Curtin wanted to get into it a little more, you know, he's a good interviewer. He said, oh, I could, first thing he said on the radio interview, I hear from the tone of your voice, you're still very disappointed in the call from the pastor. And I thought, I'm not going to be led into this. I said, actually, David, what you hear in my voice is weariness. I'm just tired of it all. And that really sums it up how I felt that day. I just never understand why people take time to phone other people and tell them they're sinful and they're wrong. I sat with a Lutheran pastor the other day. Once a year he gets three letters. Three letters from the same three people since 1991. They take time to write a letter to his church and to him to tell him how sinful he is and hopes that he will uh, repent of his awful sinful ways and that the church will turn around and become a godly place based on the Bible and in Christ again. Like the same old stuff every year around the same time, three letters from three different people, well three same people, but they don't know each other. So it's not a coordinated effort. Since 1991. Now we could just shake our heads, but we got to know we're just like that as Christians too. We love to tell people what's wrong about the world. We've all judged people morals. Morals. I didn't grow up in a gambling family. I did not grow up in a gambling family. It was the, no way. No gambling. And then I get into arguments with uh, Reverend Michael Webster, who you love about gambling as a fun pastime. Or with other people, a 50-50 draw at the Jazz Fest. I found myself a little money for the 50-50 draw. I'll find out later today. You know, I've judged people about gambling in the past. And uh, had those arguments. Wanted to be right. I'm not necessarily right. I'm not sure. Uh, but we've all had our times. We've all had our ways that we've taken Scripture and used it against people. And hurt people. And in fact, it was interesting that the uh, uh, Pope Francis, is it Francis? Yeah. It's Pope Francis, right? Is our, our, yeah, he's the Pope right now. From, uh, from South America, he, he said what early in his papacy, he said the Catholic Church needs to concentrate more on what it's for than what it's against. But then he just continues to say these awful things about gay people. And, uh, and, and, and judging people. I just find it really strange that then he keeps saying what he's against, even though he told Catholics to just stop that. But here's the tricky stuff. Here's where it gets tricky. I'm like, oh yeah, Jesus, I will just turn towards the light. I will only be what I am about. But then there are some things in the world that need to be called. There are some times where Christians need to stand up, human rights issues, and say, that's wrong. Stop that. To the Burmese government, Myanmar, or whatever situation, human rights situation we see, even right here in our own country. Well, we need to stand up and say to the mayor and to the province and the premier, homelessness is wrong, or child poverty is wrong. Like Christians do 
stand up and speak sternly about stuff at some time. So what about Jesus saying we should just keep on going? Never mind them. Just leave them alone. It's a tricky balance. So then I came back to the word rebuke. And I started to think about the word rebuke as a warning, as a charge about something of deep value. And I thought, church needs a good lesson about polarities. We need to remember we far too often about this is right, this is wrong. We're not enough about conversation. We need to be careful of our polarities and our triumphalism and our self-righteousness, for sure. And that's what Jesus was speaking about to James and John. Don't be too triumphant. Don't be too sure. But then when we do speak out against some things that absolutely God calls us to say, how do we do that the right way? I was thinking about rebuke. It's a word that I've only ever heard in relationship. We don't use it often, like garb. We don't use the word rebuke very often. I think it's a relational word. I think a word, it's a word that speaks of a relationship that always exists, already exists. Jesus rebuked the disciples. They were friends. So what if we took it that way? What if we went towards the issues that we know need to be speaking of, spoken about? The advocacy the church needs to do on the behalf of others because we are of privilege and some, many, many, many people are not. What do we, how do we do that? How do we offer rebuke? I have to say, far too often, Christians have preached and spoken without relationship. Like that pastor calling me up. Somebody else called me later in the week. I said, at the end, I said, okay, wait a minute. I'm not your pastor, and you don't come to my church, but you felt you should call me and tell me I'm wrong. Tell me about that. It was a rebuke without relationship. It's a really, it was just crabbiness. Just mean-spirited. What if we worked hard at softening our polarities by being in relationship with the people we wish to rebuke? It may be heard then in a new way. Not easy to be in relationship with people we don't like. Not easy. Could be the premier. Could be the mayor. Could be the prime minister. Could be your neighbor, your cousin on Facebook. Lois, you know, you got those family members always driving you nuts with their comments, right? It's hard to be in relationship with them. Lois is always talking to me about that. It's a very good Christian problem. What do you do with your own people when they seem so backward Stay in relationship. Speak your heart in the relationship. Trust the relationship. And then the rebuke may actually be heard. Jesus says to his friends, leave them alone. We're not even in relationship with those Samaritans. We're just passing through. We'll go on to the next village. Big deal. It's not worth it. But when it is worth it, when it is important, we need to first foster relationship then we'll speak within relationship about what's wrong in the world. Let's toss around the idea of relationship rebuke about teaching one another from inside relationship as we move to the table this morning. Because this table, I have, I have great belief that this table, every time we come to it, it offers something new. We can break ourselves open again by this table of great love and thanksgiving. We're all welcome here. We're all welcome to come up and start again. And we come with open hearts and we taught new things. And maybe this morning we'll be softened on our edges about what we really are sure is wrong or what we're really sure is right. Maybe here we'll be reminded to keep focused on the light, but that the light invites us to relationship with the places that we think things are going wrong. If there's an injustice in the world, God's love calls us to move towards those who are living out that injustice and be in relationship and conversation. Then the rebuke might be heard, then our hurt might be heard, then maybe God's love may be heard. May it be so. Amen.